Uh, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 5 today. Chapter 5. Uh, 1 John 5. We will be studying verses 6 through 13 this morning, and this passage points straight to Jesus. I mean, how refreshing and good is that to hear? I mean, uh, we go about our weeks just trying to make it through all we have to deal with in this world, through trials and ten- temptations, through difficult deci- decisions, even, the, even through all the ungodly noise we are constantly being bombarded with. I don't think it's just me who finds themselves utterly exhausted at times. Am I with all that's going on? But then we get to come here, <laughs> and we get to be refocused and refreshed. You know, as we see one another, we remember that we're not in this alone. You know, as we worship our awesome God, we're reminded that he is still on the throne. I hope you guys are doing that this morning. Was that powerful this morning? Doing it as one. You know, and, and we get to open God's word together. We can truly find nourishment when, when we feed on his truths and his precious promises here. You know, all I'll say about this passage is this is a refreshing passage this morning. As we can be all be reminded of what we have as Christians. And brothers and sisters, what we have really is who we have. And that is Jesus Christ. There's no one better than him, amen? And because John wants us to know this and continue to grow in our faith, today he presents us with undeniable proofs that show why it is essential to place all our trust solely in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for life and salvation. (laughs) This is so good. Read with me verses 6 through 13 of chapter 5. John writes this, he says, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar. Tell us what you think, John. Because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. And this is the testimony, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. We just pause and say hallelujah to that right now. He who has a son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the son of God. Lord, we thank you so much for today. Thank you for the power of your word. I thank you that we, we, this church believes it. Lord, that we come in here not to hear me, not to hear uh, funny tales, but to hear your truth. And so we just ask, Lord, that as, as you want to meet with us today, that, Lord, you would do a great work in our hearts. We love you. We praise you. We ask, Lord, that you would truly just, just grow us deeper today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, as I read through this passage, I kept thinking about what we covered a few weeks back in chapter 4, that there's one message of hope that we are to embrace in our spiritual journeys. There's one message we as Christians are to proclaim to this lost world. There's one message that has the power to save, to change eternal destinations, and bring us into a personal and loving relationship with God himself. And that message is Jesus is the savior of the world. Now, do we believe this to be true? Do we really believe this? Why? How do we know this to be the truth? Because I have a warm, fuzzy feeling inside my heart that I just know Or because my parents took me to church when I was a kid, gave me a Bible, and I still have that same Bible today. Or because I'm an American. You know, and I just saw a poll that said 70% of Americans are Christians, so I'm pretty sure I fit into that that statistic. I don't know if that statistic is after it, but nope. John tells us the exact answer in our passage. That we come to faith that we are Christians because we receive the testimony, the evidence that God himself has laid out for us. And the main word John uses in the in this, in this passage is the word witness, which we read multiple times in this section. The word witness comes from the same root word in the Greek where we get our word martyr. Now most of us, most of the time, when we think of the word martyr, our minds probably go straight to those who are persecuted and killed in other countries for their faith. Or we think of Stephen the, as he's called the first martyr of the church. Or we think of, we think of death, those who die. And it's probably, that's probably what we should do because it's what our word means in English most of the time. But the Greek word for martyr carries a different understanding. It doesn't quite go that far. It simply means to testify or to give a good report. It's when someone is called upon to remember something and give an accurate account. 
It's one who, who testifies to the truth of an event. It's a witness, as it's translated. And possibly the clearest example of where we find a witness is probably in a courtroom scene, correct? Where a witness is called to take the stand and testify. Which, speaking of Americans, what would we Americans do without the ultra-imperative celebrity court cases? I mean, don't you feel so privileged to see them televised today? What would we do without them? But with any courtroom, jury, trial setting, not just celebrity ones, we see witnesses summoned to give their account of what they know or what they saw or what they heard take place regarding a specific situation. And because their testimony is presented as evidence and will heavily contribute to the overall verdict of the case, a witness is instructed and expected, you've heard it, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. The witness is to be honest and reliable as they report facts accurately to their best ability. Well, this is what we have in our passage today. In this spiritual courtroom, the Apostle John presents trustworthy and reliable witnesses. But the, wit the testimonies that these witnesses bring are not just for any general situation or regarding a well-known celebrity. These witnesses are called upon to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about God the Son and who exactly is. He is. And they are presented before us so we can weigh all the evidence and come to the right decision for our own personal lives about Jesus. And I will say this decision is extremely important because it carries with it eternal consequences. So in verse 6, we begin to see these witnesses. John says, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. You know, John states that Jesus is the Christ. And the greatest thing I heard out of Pastor Andrew's message last week was, we need to know that Christ is not Jesus' last name, right? <laughs> that is his title, Christ, not his last name. Which means, Christ means he is the Messiah. He, he's the anointed one. He's the promised one who's prophesied about that would come to rescue people from their sin. That's the claim John makes here. But in order to prove it, the first two witnesses have to be summoned to testify. And those two witnesses are the water and the blood. <laughs> Some of us, must, most of us are probably like, okay, wait, what? Water and blood are the witnesses? How can water and blood be the convincing evidence to place our trust in Jesus? You know, I don't even know what to think there. Only has John, old man John, fallen off his rocker literally because I don't know how this makes any sense at all. Oh, it makes sense. And, and no, John has not lost it in any way. John is actually being very intentional. And what I believe he's doing by bringing up the water and the blood is deliberately refuting a specific heresy that was taking place at this time. You know, just like there are some wacky and unbiblical views about Jesus today, there, are so, there were some wacky views about Jesus back then in the first century as well. And one of the false teachings circulating in the church was, was from a group called the Gnostics who thought they had God all figured out. Then instead of trusting the scriptures and what was instructed by the apostles, the Gnostics rejected all the Bible claimed is true because they thought they had super knowledge as they came to their own conclusions and beliefs about Jesus. Not too different from what many people think about Jesus today. They come to their own conclusions. But the Gnostics rejected they so, so much truth found in God's word. But they mainly denied his deity, Jesus' deity, and the essential teaching that Jesus had always existed as God and remained God as he took on humanity and lived the sinless life while here on the earth. See, the Gnostics rejected that Jesus was the Christ, as John stated here, but they believed Jesus was only a man and temporarily had this Christ spirit upon him. They alleged that his, this, this spirit came upon Jesus at his baptism in the Jordan, but was only there upon Jesus for the three plus years of his earthly ministry. When he was doing his miraculous works, like healing the sick, casting out demons, and feeding the multitudes, that it was only for that time of dynamic ministry, Jesus had the Christ spirit upon him. Which means they also believe this spirit departed from Jesus before he suffered and died on the cross. That Jesus was not the Christ upon the cross, but he was only an ordinary man, which is no bueno. <laughs> not good doctrine at all. And, and John agrees, and he refutes this ungodly, heretical, temporary Christ spirit belief by saying, that's wrong. That's not the truth. The truth is that Jesus was the promised one, the Christ, the, the promised one, the Christ, his, his entire life, and both the water and the blood prove it. They testify to who Jesus is. So first, the water. You know, even though the Gnostics believe, belief was blasphemous 
regarding the events of Jesus' bas- baptism and this, the, uh, that this uh, temporary Christ spirit was upon him, though that was way off, the ch- there truly was something spectacular that happened that day when Jesus was baptized in the water. That day and that event marked the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, and the testimony of the water that witnessed this event is incredible. I think we all can recount what took place. You know, as Jesus was immersed by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, something so supernatural occurred. We, we read that immediately as Jesus came up from the water, this water, the heavens opened, and the Spirit of God, the true Spirit of God, not some made-up spirit, descended upon Jesus like a dove. And just as that happened, suddenly there was a voice from heaven, the voice of the Father, that said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. There at the baptism, there was proof that Jesus is the Christ. And the evidence was the Holy Spirit falling upon Jesus and the acknowledgement of the Father. And if you will, the water that was there that very day that is personified here is called to the stand and is able to testify that this all occurred as Jesus' earthly ministry began. It's, it's like the water is saying, hey, I was there. I was there. And what I saw showed that Jesus was the Christ, that he is the Christ. I heard the voice of the Father from, from heaven. I saw the, the Spirit descend upon him like a dove. And I could testify that this is true. But there's a second witness who can add to the facts of the case. Look at, the, look at verse 6 again. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. Witness number two is the blood. And its, it's testimony is probably the toughest to hear, but one that brings further clarity to who Jesus is and all he came to do. The water brought evidence by testifying to how Jesus' earthly ministry began, but the blood, the blood testifies to all Jesus was able to accomplish at the end of his ministry, of his earthly ministry, where God the Son gave his life and became the perfect sacrifice as he hung in our place to satisfy the wrath and judgment that we deserve. And not to be too graphic, but there was a tremendous amount of blood that day. And that blood was observing the scene way before Jesus was up upon the cross. Before the crucifixion, there was blood. There was blood when the crown of thorns was being pressed down into Jesus' brow. There was blood from him being punched in the face, from his beard being heavily ripped out of his face. There was blood from the scourging as glass-infused whips ripped the skin off his back. But then on the cross, there was even more. There was blood from Jesus' hands and feet when they were pierced by the nails that attached his marred more than any man, man's body upon the cross, and, and he was attached there. You know, I can't help but imagine the scene and the stains of our Lord's innocent blood drenching that wooden cross that he hung on for me <laughs> and for you. There's so much blood that day, but the blood has something to say. That blood saw everything that Jesus went through. All that he had to endure. But that blood saw Jesus complete all he set out to do. (laughs) That blood could testify to it all, to all that it saw. But the blood could also testify to all it heard as well. You know, it could recall for for the court, if you will, all our, our Lord spoke upon the cross. The blood was there when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was there. The, it was there. The blood was there when he looked over at the thief on the cross who acknowledged who Jesus really is and said, Surely, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The blood could hear Jesus alone as the father had to turn his head from his son. He heard the, the words of Jesus say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But the blood also heard the words Jesus spoke right before he bowed down his head and gave up his spirit, which was to telestai. It is finished. Paid in full. His mission was accomplished. You know, unlike what the false teachers in John's day claimed, unlike what many today claim as well, salvation is found in no one else. For there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And the blood is a reliable witness who testifies that that name is Jesus. And really, th- that blood belongs to Jesus himself. It's his own blood that was shed so we could be saved. You know, I love what Peter says in his first epistle, chapter 1, verse 19. He says, we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, 
as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. There ain't no blood like Jesus' blood. Amen? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but, fill it in, the blood of Jesus. You know, we read about it. We sing about it. But we need to believe it with all our hearts. We are redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. His spotless, innocent, precious, priceless blood. We were bought by blood. It's not our works or our effort. It's not our niceness or our good deeds outweighing our bad. It's not our sacrifice at all that can save us. It's his. His and the blood testifies to that. Two witnesses have been called to testify, the water and the blood. You convinced yet? Most of you are. For those who aren't, I know some of you might be thinking, you know, it sure would be nice if there was some video evidence. Wouldn't that be great? What a bummer that iPhones weren't established until like 2007 or whatever it was. I mean, if there was just a quick snippet posted on social media, the evidence would be overwhelming. I'd even take a VHS recording. Some of you are so young you don't even know what a VHS is, but that's okay. But the next witness is even better than video evidence. In the last part of verse 6, and it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. Here John reveals witness number three, the Holy Spirit. And he shows us that the Holy Spirit gives further support to the water and the blood. To use courtroom lingo, the Holy Spirit corroborates the testimony of the water and the blood. Jumping down to verse 8, we read, And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. There is no conflicting testimonies here. There's no different witnesses brought to the stand. They, they're unified. There's no inconsistencies. The Holy Spirit adds credibility to their testimony. How does he do that? Because he was there the whole entire time. He was there at Jesus' baptism. He was there at the cross. And he has been working in this world ever since that time. He is here today continuing to bear witness. So yeah, much better than some video feed that can be edited or manipulated or taken out of context, we have the trustworthy testimony of God, the Holy Spirit. And one of the Holy Spirit's main roles and purposes is to constantly testify to the truth of Jesus. I mean, Jesus straight up said this to his disciples in John 15, verse 26. He said, when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me martyr. He will report the facts. He will bear witness and constantly point to Jesus. And this is even true towards the unbeliever. Jesus says in John 16, 8, that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me. The Holy Spirit is, is there to point people to Jesus, to make Jesus real to them and show them their need for the one true Savior. How awesome is that to know? This, to me, when I was I'm studying this, this, is, this is, brings me so much comfort. So much comfort because I know many people that I want to see come to Jesus, but they're not coming to him. And, and I'm, when are they going to come? What am I to do? What am I to share? How, what am I to study? How can I argue them into the kingdom of God? This shows me it's not up to me at all. That, uh, that I don't have to be the one at all to do it because there's someone much greater and much more powerful than, that, than me, who is working in their lives, Scripture says. He will use us, for sure. He will use us to share and shine. I mean, Jesus has called us to make disciples of the nations. That's the Great Commission. He wants us to be able to give an answer for the hope within us. We have a responsibility. The Bible teaches us we have a responsibility. How will they hear unless someone is sent? We know that we have a responsibility. But we also have to know and believe that the Holy Spirit is working in the world, drawing people to Jesus. He did it for us, and he is still doing it today. You know, I, I love, I love, I love, I hope you guys do this. Looking back and seeing the Spirit line all these things up to the day I got, gave my life to Jesus Christ. I mean, I love it. I, I know, I, looking back and seeing and believing that my parents prayed for me. Well, at least I know my mom did. I don't know about my dad. My mom prayed for me. <laughs> and I, I look back, and I, I think about this, how he lined up this relationship with the high school acquaintance, and how we, he would just want to meet and he recently got saved, and he wanted, he's like, let's go get st some coffee bean. And I spent way too much money on coffee bean, but it was worth it because we, we, my, I had this, this, this desire in me. I, I knew that there was more. I knew that there was more to, to life, to the things I was doing. And then when I was 19 years old, I met Jesus. I gave my life to him. 
I look at all these ways, that all the things that the, the, the Holy Spirit was doing and how he was, he was leading me to Jesus. And you know, talk about confirming through water and blood. When I understood the blood <laughs> and what Jesus did, did the water come? <laughs> as it just broke me. <laughs> as I just stood there and I couldn't believe what he would do for me. I mean, it's everything. It's everything. The Holy Spirit is working. He's testifying of Jesus. He will do it through us. I mean, just the other day, he will open doors. I was talking to someone that I want to see saved so badly. And this person had a cultural question. And they were asking me about it. How, how would I deal with this? And I said, you know, for me, the most important thing is for you to come to Jesus Christ. And, and, you, and you to make him Lord of your life. For you to believe what we have, because it's nothing like it. And he will change those other things. Those things that I believe you need to get out of your life, he'll change it, because that's what he does. But you need to come to him. And I believe he, he's going to open doors. I do. I believe, I believe he, he will use us to plant those seeds, maybe water seeds. That's what we're called to do. But it's not us who do it. God is the one who gives the increase. God is the one who saves, not us. And I believe we should be trusting that, that, ju- that just as he uses us for people's lives, he wants to use other Christians as well in those that we, that we want to see saved. That he will, he, will, he will use them to speak the truth. Maybe they'll hear them when they won't hear us. Our hometown, they won't listen to us, but they'll listen to someone else. The Holy Spirit is moving. The Holy Spirit is bearing witness. He's convicting people of sin. He's wanting people to come to Jesus. John says the Holy Spirit is broken, but, but it's not only to the unbeliever. It's us too. After Jesus says the Spirit will convict the world of their need for Jesus in John 16, 8, he adds this for us in verse 13 and 14. Jesus, Jesus says, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Church, where do we find what is the Lord's? Right here. This is where we find it. Hebrews tells us the volume of the book is written of Jesus. The Holy Spirit will reveal more and more to us about Jesus through it. This is Holy Spirit inspired. You know that, right? He supernaturally led 40 authors to record 66 books from all different walks of life to give us a consistent and accurate record of Jesus. Here is found the real historical Jesus who fulfilled over 300 plus prophecies. Do you realize how blessed we are to have this? In it, we learn about how Jesus walked, what he said and what he accomplished, but it doesn't stop there. We are told that the Bible is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit. And you know what The Holy Spirit will constantly work through God's word and use it in our lives to help our faith and trust in the Lord to grow. Through it, we are able to, to read and embrace the promises that lead to the satisfying life that our Lord has for us. Do you believe that? I believe it now more than ever. It's time for us to really grab hold and believe this with everything in us, especially through the questions of life, especially through the trials that we have to go through, especially when we look at this world and we go, ooh, what's going on? We need to come back to this and see what God says. Because if we do, we will get closer and closer to Jesus. If we do, our faith and hope in, in Jesus will be strengthened because, again, this is what the Holy Spirit does. He will declare, he will glorify, he will always testify of Jesus. Who needs YouTube? Who needs Instagram? Who needs TikTok? We have the third person of the triune God bearing witness that Jesus is the Christ. Amen? Well, since we have the Holy Spirit bearing witness, why not add the whole Trinity? Verse 7 says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, John's favorite, one of, favorite, one of his favorite names for Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Just as there are testimonies from the witness, witnesses on earth, there is a great and glorious witness in heaven, and that witness is the Trinity. The Trinity. God is three in one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit equally make up the triune God. Each one is separate in activity and function, but each one is united as one at the same time. Hearing that, you might be like, huh? One single God and yet three distinct persons. Justin, explain how that all works together so I can fully comprehend the Trinity. Okay. Okay. Maybe, like others have attempted to do, maybe I would respond by giving you an illustration. You've heard the illustrations, right? We brought up water. 
Maybe you've heard the water analogy. That tr- the, tr- the Trinity is like water in the sense that water can come in three different forms. Water can be a liquid, water can be a solid ice, or water can be a gas, steam. It has three distinct qualities, and yet it is still water. Same with God. Three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinct, yet one, like water. Okay? Some have used the description of a three-leaf clover to describe the Trinity. Let's say a three-leaf clover. That's what it's described. And that thought is that there are three different cloves that make up the clover, and yet it still remains the clover. God is made up of three, but is still one. Eh. Still others, the Trinity <laughs> is like an egg. How about that one? The egg consists of a shell, a yolk, and the white. There are three distinct parts, but they are all together unified as one like God. Hmm. God and an egg. Interesting. You know, I get what people are trying to do with the illustrations, but really, no matter how hard we try, all analogies, they fall short, don't they? And that's because we're talking about Almighty God. How can an illustration like a clover or like an egg ever come close to the vastness and complexity of our all-powerful and infinite God? I don't think, correction, I know no illustration could. So again, if you were to ask me to fully explain the Trinity, my only response would be, I can't, I can't. And that's because I don't fully comprehend the greatness of it myself. It's beyond my comprehension and really any human's understanding for that matter because we're talking about God, who he is. And yet, this is what the Bible teaches. And if the Bible teaches it, then we're to believe it. Just like we are to believe other things about God that are hard for us to understand. I mean, we read in Isaiah, his ways are not our ways, nor are his thoughts our thoughts. There is so much about God that is tough to comprehend, such as how is he working all things together for good in our lives, like Romans 8, 28 says, like we say. How is he doing that? Do you always understand that? Oh, this is piece of cake. Yeah, God is working this for good right now. feels horrible, but he's working it for good. Do you understand it? No, you don't understand it. What about his incredible love for us? You know, covering the epistle of 1 John, I really am finding I don't understand God's love. I'm growing in it, but I, the more I study it, the more I don't understand it. Because how could he love us so much that he would allow his only begotten, one-of-a-kind son to suffer for me? How could God turn his face away from his son on the cross because of his love for me? I don't get it, but I believe it. Especially, I don't get it when I know that I was a sinner. And he did it all while, while I was lost in my sin. He did it. I don't see how I will ever understand those things and, and so much more about his attributes and character. But if this God-breathed, Holy Spirit-inspired book teaches it, the one thing I need to do is embrace it with my whole heart. And just like I do with all things that I don't understand, that's what I'm to do with the Trinity. I'm to believe that God exists as, as three distinct persons. Each person is fully God, and yet there's only one God because that's what the Bible teaches. Is anyone with me on that? Okay, I'm glad five of you are. <laughs> For the rest of you, you've got to read the rest of this. But think about what he's saying here. We are told here regarding the, the remarkable testimony taking place in heaven that, that the triune God who has always existed, who is glorious, all-powerful, and who has never failed or fallen short in any way ever is in heaven testifying that salvation is found in Christ alone. I'm thankful for that. I mean, you talk about confidence. You talk about assurance and convincing evidence. The Trinity is declaring that this one message, the truth of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, to be 100% true and accurate. You want evidence beyond a reasonable doubt? Who better to believe than God in heaven? Which is what John states there in verse 9. He says, if, or that could be, since we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. Every day, we will embrace things that people say. And John is not saying that's necessarily a bad thing. It's not that we should dismiss everything people communicate all the time until they prove themselves to us, prove themselves true. No, I mean, it might be wise to dismiss some of the things you're reading on uh, online news or hearing on the news. You might not be a bad practice to dismiss some of those things. But John is not saying stop trusting people. He's saying since we are quick to believe people, and receive their words without questioning their accuracy, validity, or intentions, how much more should we receive the witness of God in our lives? And yet, so often we don't. I mean, h- how many of us sit back as we're going through something, and we're, we, we think, does God really, does he really have my best interest in mind? Does God really care? 
is he really going to come through for me? I don't know. How can I trust him? Because he's God. That's why you can trust him. I absolutely love what John does here and the logic he brings. He's saying, if you're going to believe people and receive their witness about various types of things daily in life, how much more are we to believe God when he brings testimony and truths about Jesus? And I don't know, I mean, if you know this, so I'll, I'll enlighten you. I've got some super knowledge right here. About a little super insight about God. I'll tell you. You know, God never speaks falsely. God never exaggerates. He never embellishes stories or wickedly schemes and deceives to get ahead. There's someone else that does that, who wants the position of God, but is not allowed to have it. But that's not what God does ever. See, God always tells the truth. He always does what is pure and right and good. He is faithful and true always. And when it comes to salvation, according to God, there's only one who can deliver people. One Christ, one Redeemer who has done it all. Only one, and that is Jesus the Son. The second part of verse 9, for this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. This is his message. This is his testimony. In, in fact, all the witnesses' testimonies have been brought forth. All the evidence in the spiritual courtroom has been presented, and the great counselor rests his case. And now it's time for the verdict. The decision of the heart must be decided. It's our moment of truth. Will you believe the testimony of the water, the blood, the, uh, the, the spirit? Will you believe the witness of the triune God, or will you reject it? But before you make the decision, John tells us what the outcome of our choice will be, verses 10 through 12. It says, He who believes in the Son of God has a witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who ha has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. I mean, these are some pretty strong and clear-cut words right here. I mean, there's no sugarcoating right here. I mean, I just picture people who don't like what is being said going, John, those words don't sound too loving. You know, if God is love, like you said a few verses back, he should accept everything. I mean, God should just save everyone no matter what they believe. I mean, John, this whole Jesus is the only way thing is so narrow-minded. These words sound divisive, not loving. I don't think you should be referred to as the apostle of love anymore, talking like that. But in reality, these statements strengthen his title of the apostle of love because he's telling them what is true. And not bringing them the, tr the, the true mes message is not loving at all. I mean, there's a saying that I heard a long time ago, something, something like this, we can love people straight to hell which would not be loving at all by not telling them the truth. But Don, John doesn't want that. No, he, he loves people so much. He's the apostle, apostle of love. He is bringing to them the true message, which isn't even his message. But the message, the testimony of God, it's, it's his message. And because this is God's message, John has to be straight. He has to tell it like it is and make it as clear as possible because there's no middle ground. There's no alternate route. The most important decision we can make in our lives is what we do with the Son. There's one message, one truth, and we will either receive it and believe it, or we will deny it. There's only two camps, those who believe and those who don't believe. We mix it a lot in our culture today. Oh, they're not really... There's two camps, those who believe, saved, those who don't. They're unsaved. And look at what John says in verse 10. He who believes in the Son has the witness in himself, which, which means if you believe in Jesus, you accept the testimony of God. Everything the witnesses claim. But notice, as the verse goes on, it says, he who does not believe God has made him a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his son. I mean, you think about that statement. People may even argue, no, 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 I don't believe all this, but I would never call God a liar. I don't believe what you believe, but I, I don't think God's a liar. I mean, we would even come to that conclusion as well. You know, equating unbelief with calling God a liar might make us go, what? But John would counter that and say, no, that is exactly, that is exactly what people are doing who reject the message of God. They're calling God a liar. If you reject Jesus as Savior of the world, which is the message, the testimony of, uh, of God, if you are claiming you don't need Jesus for salvation, for life's purpose, to lead and guide your life, then you are saying that all God has proclaimed for centuries is wrong. That all that is written here is not the truth. You're in essence saying God has misled and not told the truth. And if you believe someone is not telling the truth, what does that mean you're calling them? Okay, I'll give it to you. A liar! That's what you're calling them. John's good. You see how good he is? I mean, he's, he's wise. And that's because he's inspired by the Holy Spirit as he wrote this. If we say Jesus was only a moral person, 
or he was a great teacher, or, or one of many ways to, to God, then we are calling God a liar. Because that's not what this says. This says, Jesus is the definite article, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. John 14, 6. But not only are people who deny this, this calling God a liar, John says there, there's no way to have eternal life. Verse 12, he who is the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Without the Son, you have, have to stand on your own works. And there isn't anyone who can be made right with God that way. There's no forgiveness that way. There's no heaven that way. There's no life that way. But praise God, there's a flip side to all that. There is an alternate route, the right one, God's route, that is available for all. If you believe and receive God's testimony, not only are you not calling God a liar, but you're calling him true, you then also get to experience all that he has for you, and Jesus died to give you. <laughs> I mean, look at verse 11, and this is the testimony that God has given us, eternal life. And this life is in his son. Receiving the son means everything. It means everything. It means we, we can once and, all, once and for all be forgiven of all our sins, past, present, and future. It means our eternal destination changes from total separation from God to eternity with God in heaven forever. You know, eternal life in, is heaven. And being promised, that is enough, right? I mean, if, if God didn't give me anything except that I know that I'm going to be with him forever, that's enough, especially, you know, as I look at this world, <laughs> the craziness that goes on here. I'm like, okay, just give me eternity. But God's message is so good that eternal life is not only that. Jesus said this in John thir uh, 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I mean, this means, yes, we are given eternity. Yes, we are forgiven of our sins, but we are brought into this personal, intimate, loving relationship with the God of the universe that we get to call him dad. You know, I was thinking about someone this week, and I'm just like, I, I don't, you know, I had a great dad. You know, my dad is, is he, can, he can be a little bit better, but <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, he's here. I, he was a great dad, and, I, and he came to my baseball games, and he, he was there for me, and, you know, um, but there's some of you, man, you, you didn't have a good dad, but now you do have a good dad, and this dad loves you so much that he will walk with you every single day that he will be with you, that he will be working behind the scenes, that he will encourage you, that he will not give you too much to handle. But he, he will just, he will, he will have, you will have access to him anytime you want. You could come to his throne of grace and you can receive mercy constantly. I don't know what you got br brought up with, but man, what you have now, what you can have now, is better than anything. This is eternal life, that they may know you. I mean, think about that. Think about the fellowship of the Trinity. Think about what, what we are gifted. Man, I, I, I love people. I'm a people person. But man, there's nothing like knowing God. There's nothing like having a relationship with him where you can struggle and you can blow it and he's there to pick you back up. When you could be walking in fear and he can comfort you. When you're like, I don't know what's going to happen. He'll be right there with you. He'll point you in the right direction. He'll bring people into your life. This is what we have. This is what you can have. There's no one like him. He who has a son has life. He who does not have the son does, uh, of God does not have life. But look at John says in verse 13. He says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the, son, the name of the Son of God. I mean, continue to believe. Do you continue to believe? Yeah, I gave my life to Jesus Christ as, you know, at a Harvest Crusade, or yeah, I came forward one time, or I believed, or I grew up in it, or whatever. I, I know I'm a Christian. Yeah, but do you, are you continuing in it? Are you growing in it? I mean, John, I mean, seriously, I, 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 I don't know what, I was, I was thinking about this this week. I was like, why is it every time we're going through a book, that becomes my favorite book? When I first became a Christian, it was Ephesians. Ephesians, I mean, come on. I mean, amazing. But then I, like, started studying, like, Philippians. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Philippians is amazing. And then it's like, oh, my goodness. Colossians is amazing. And then you're like, oh, my goodness. No matter what we're in, this is the most amazing book ever. And right now I'm finding First John is the most amazing book ever. 
And, 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 and when, when John, when you, when you picture the relationship that John had with his Lord, I mean, laying his head on Jesus' chest, doing, I mean, just, just imagine that scene where, when Jesus is upon the cross and he's like, behold your, your son, behold your mother, when he's talking about taking care of, of Mary. Think about that moment. He's so close to Jesus. He loves Jesus so much. I'm going to do anything for you. I'm going to take care of your whole mom. I'll do that. He'd do anything for him. And I'm like, man, what do we have? John is like, guys, this is what I'm writing about. The whole reason I've given you this epistle is so that you may have eternal life, that you may know it. Do you know it? Do you know that you know that you know that you know? We, we talked about that before. The Spirit is bearing witness with our spirit that we can know it. But it's real. This is everything. I don't know what you're living for. I don't know what your purpose in life is, but this is the true purpose. And if you get it, if you understand it, if you, if you realize how much God loves you and the relationship you can have with him, it changes everything. God is real. The purpose of him writing, John writing this, that we can know, that, that, like, that you can, give, this is just not like, this is not just experiential. This is like, it's implanted. This is implanted that you can know. I mean, God, God is testifying so much. He will implant that knowledge that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know, that you belong to him. I love it. John, and then Paul, of course. Oh, it's my new anthem. <laughs> that I may know him. That I may know him. I don't care. Whatever happens. I mean, I get those mountaintop experiences. I mean, I walked in here today. It was, it was awesome. I don't know. I, it's crazy. I'm just rambling, but that's okay. I walk in here today, and, and the worship is going on, and my, my heart melts because I see that, that, that we're gathered together to get closer to God, to worship him, to spend our lives with him. Yeah, there's, there's crazy things that are happening. There, you know what? I'm going to prophesy right now. There's going to be more crazy things that happen. But we have God, and he's working in our lives. Do you believe it? Do you have it? Do you receive it? Believe and receive. And then you, if you believe and receive, you become children of God, and you have the best dad ever. <laughs> That's what we have, church. That's what John is tell, telling us. I've written this. We're getting towards the end. I've written all this. Think it back. Meditate on those things that he said. We're in all this, that you would know, that you would know that you have life in the Son, because that's what real life is. Amen? Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for this day that we can get into your word, and oh, Lord, it's, it, you're amazing. I, I just pray, Lord, that we would just be in awe of you all the time, that we wouldn't take our eyes off you, Lord, in the midst of our trials, our difficulties, our hardships, Lord, that we would know that you're, you're everything, you have life for us. You are life, and we belong to you. So keep working in our lives, Lord. I just pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray if there's anyone in here today who doesn't know you, Lord, who maybe thinks that they're just doing check marks by coming here. I went to church. I was nice to people. Whatever it is, Lord, that they would know that they could have a real relationship with you. And it's only because of everything that was done for us. So help us to, to truly believe you, truly trust you. I pray for those people who don't know you, Lord. If there's someone in here, and even today, Lord, even in this last song, they'd be bold to just, just come. Just come. Open their heart to you. There's nothing, nothing better than knowing, than knowing you. For all of us, Lord, just help us. Help us to believe. Help us to trust. Help us to walk continually believe in the Son. We may know we have life. I know it. Sometimes I doubt, but I know you're good. You're faithful. It's what your word says. It's your testimony. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Will you please stand? <coughs> Let's sing to our awesome God. Amen.